Unforgiven by Sylvanus. It's worse than the last time you tried to visit. The once magnificent house had been unkempt before, but now it's grey and grubby, its clouds half feral and unravelling, its rainbow reduced to a runny trickle. It's lost altitude, too, sinking lower and lower like a leaking balloon, until now it's drifting merely a hoof length above the ground. The whole place reeks of unwashed pony and misery. She looks worse, too. She's curled up on what's left of her floor, a ball of matted blue coat and tangled mane and tail and rumpled feathers that haven't been preened in weeks. Her face is filthy with tears and snot and sweat. She's cradling something in her forehooves, and suddenly your stomach clenches. It's a horn, cracked and scorched black at the tip, but still a familiar shade of lavender. You swallow the lump in your throat. You don't want to do this. But Rainbow Dash is your friend. You owe her this. R Rainbow Dash? You say quietly. Her ears twitch, and she lifts her head. You cringe. Her eyes are raw and puffy, and they narrow when they find you. Get out, Fluttershy, she growls, then lowers her head and nuzzles the horn. You take a hesitant step forward. Please, Rainbow Dash, we need to talk. She doesn't respond. She just lies there, holding the one thing she has left of the pony she loved with her whole heart. You force yourself to take a deep breath and try again. Rainbow Dash, you, you can't keep doing this. You can't shut yourself away in here for the rest of your life. Nothing. What about your dreams? The Wonderbolts? She wouldn't want you to throw that away. Shut! Up! She snaps out of it, her voice strained and cracked, like she has broken glass in her throat. R Rainbow! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! You don't get to talk about her! You... you coward! You stupid, useless, worthless coward! You were expecting that, but it still makes you fall back on your haunches, trembling. It's your fault, Fluttershy! Rainbow Dash, please... I'm so sorry. It's your fault. It's your fault she's dead. I'm sorry. Sorry it won't bring her back, Fluttershy. She died because of you. She died saving you because you were too stupid to save yourself. It should have been you. She should still be here. It hurts to hear Rainbow say it. You shudder and squirm, but you can't escape her furious, anguished words or the memories that burn in your head. I'm sorry. You whisper, even though you know that your sorrow will never be enough. I hate you! She screams. Her eyes are wide and wild, her dirty rainbow mane in disarray. And then her hooves are crashing into your face. You don't try to back away. You let her hit you, and hit you, and hit you. Because she is right. It is your fault. You're pathetic. You deserve to be hit for what you did. You deserve the pain. So you don't protest as the vision in your right eye goes red and blurry. Or as your nose cracks. Or as teeth pop out of your gums. You just sit there and weep silently for Twilight and for the broken pony she left behind. From Afar by Cynical You and I, we know each other well. I met you by accident, really. You were simply in the right place at the right time when we bumped into one another. I apologized, helped you pick up where you left off, and then went home. I didn't think much else of you. You were just someone I passed in the street, someone I saw for less than a minute. I never thought you'd be who you'd be. You proved me otherwise when you took us through the Everfree. You showed me just 
who you were when you faced the nightmare alone and with no plan. I'm guessing you felt what happened that day. What happened when you joined us all with the elements of harmony and joined our destinies forever. You felt the same strand, the same trembling connection that was formed between the six of us. You could see the rest of us, and we could see you. We could see you for who you really were. Everything after that just seemed token, pointless. Hadn't we already joined forces as firm friends to change the course of history? What else could we do that would prove our friendship? You went along with it, though. You agreed to do what our princess asked and promised her you'd do your best. From week to week, you met with the five of us, all of us still feeling that strange connection. We never thought that it might have been dangerous. No, it felt safe. It felt like it was pulling us all together, closer and closer as the best of the best of friends. You sent a report to Celestia every week, every week updating her with lessons and reminders of friendship. I don't think I was in many of them. I was always too busy doing my own thing. I would have put it down and come straight to you, though, if you'd asked. You were too nice to do that, though, weren't you? You'd never ask someone to stop doing what they loved. It was something that I respected in you. You never let go of your dream, no matter what. Then things changed. Chaos was unleashed on the world, and we were told to bring law and order back. Not that the five of us were much help. That link, that link we'd had since the first time we met, since we first met properly, I thought it was broken. I thought that I had broken it, and I broke with it. You were the only one who didn't give up. You had to find us and set us right. You uncovered the bonds and showed them to each of us to get us to believe again. I get that, and I'm grateful for it. You got better at it, though. By the time you came to me, you got it down to a T. The bonds were mended and we were firm friends again. We stormed into the heart of the chaos and kicked its ass from our world. I'm sure you felt it then, too. The bonds grew. We were inseparable, the firmest friends any could hope to be. And then... I started feeling more. I don't know about anyone else. Maybe it was just me, or maybe each of us started looking at you in a new light. It was you. It was all about you. You were what made us. The elements work. I wanted... I don't even know what I wanted. I, I wanted to be near. To offer my help. To do something to help you. I wanted to go to you after you'd removed chaos from the world and embrace you, to say sorry for what I... what we'd all done. I dismissed the whole episode as a side effect from the elements. What else was I supposed to think at that time? I had absolutely no idea myself. Honestly, though, I think it was just me. The others celebrated long and hard while I just thought about what had happened. I had felt something more for you. I had wanted to help you and to protect you. It's, it's hard to explain. It was almost as if I could sense your importance in the world. I thought I could see your influence on the world. How you could shape it and change it. How could I not be intrigued? How could I not be amazed? I wanted to be part of it. To be a part of something more important than me. How can I explain it? I wanted to be near you. That's as far as the reasoning stretched. You were brilliant and beautiful and just amazing. Then I woke the next morning and felt the same. It hadn't been an episode. I concluded, very simply, that I had a crush on you. What did I do about it? Absolutely nothing. What could I have done? I could have knocked on your door and come inside to talk it over. I could have met you at our weekly picnic and done something rash. I could have yelled my crush from the rooftops, but I'm not that strong. To announce my interest to the whole of Ponyville would have been too much. I did none of them, simply watched you from afar instead. I could never quite bring myself to confess 
to tell you what I've been hiding for fear of rejection. You've probably guessed that all my life is a mask. It's true, for the most part. Time and time again, there have been ponies who hurt my feelings. Some worse than others. But I'd rather not remember them. I looked for some way that was less obvious. To save your reputation and save my own blasted fragility. Maybe I could have courted you like they did in my grandfather's younger years. Maybe I could have asked you out for a quick lunch and a chat. Maybe I could have been braver than I was. Still, I did nothing. I'm willing to take another risk. The point is that I don't deal with my feelings well. If I'd spilled my secrets in my heart to you, then you'd said no. I don't like to think what would have happened. Suffice it to say, it would not have been the best moment of my life. I wonder how many others of our friends have seen past my mask. One of them I told when we were small. She saw me change and she knew what I was like before. Another had figured it out for herself. She had seen past me and kept her door open if I chose to talk. A third had probably guessed and the fourth were shrewd beyond belief. And for all they knew about me, consoling me wouldn't be an option if you said no. The risk was too high. The only way I could live my life was to keep you in the sidelines and to draw my focus elsewhere. But eventually, I know that it's not going to work anymore. I know that sooner or later, I will have to tell you. If only for closure in the concrete fact that you would answer. Sooner or later. I wonder how much longer I can keep doing this. Truthfully, I don't know. I've been content for so long, but I don't know how long it is until I'm not content with just content. One day I will have to face my fears and talk to you, knowing that you will have the option as I present my heart to you, to tear it to pieces before my eyes. N not that you'd ever mean to. You'd soften the blow and apologize until your voice was hoarse from saying sorry and mine was dead from rejecting each and every one. No matter how many times you'd insist that it was you, not I, that was at fault, I'd still leave that encounter with hooves of lead and a head full of unshed tears. Maybe I'd retreat to my house, or maybe I'd seek solace a few miles further out. Maybe a few hundred miles further out. You'd know, though. You'd know where I was. Maybe you wouldn't seek me out, though. Not yet. You'd give me a little time to get a lid on my feelings. Then you'd come and find me. I hope it'd just be you that would come, though. I don't think I could face the others. And that would be that. Another chapter of my life over and done with. It wouldn't be my best chapter, and it would certainly be a turning point in my life, but it would be done, and I would have my answer. We could go back to how everything was before, before I asked you, and no one would ever be the wiser. But there was another option to consider. I hadn't thought much about it, to be frank. It's such a small chance, I suppose, for you to consider me and the link between us. I could hope that the link ran both ways. I could hope that you would say yes. I could plan it all. I could bump into you just like when we first met. I could apologize and offer to accompany you back home. I could run the cattle and ask what you wanted. I could go to you and ask the question. And then you'd give me your answer. Less Like It Should Be by Quirky J Three years ago, today, I told you that Rainbow Dash is dead. There was no tale to tell. She left us one evening, went to sleep, and never woke up. An attack was the term used most often. Something neural, something cardiovascular. 
no one knows for sure. There was no glory in it, no radicalness, no lives saved, no feats of daring, no bravado, nor loyalty, nor courage. There was only a sudden, very great hole torn in our lives. You were there when we lit our pyre. You didn't cry. You couldn't cry. We did. We cried for you, perhaps. I know we cried for her. We certainly cried for ourselves. You told me, told us, that life would go on, that we'd return to our jobs, to our friendships, and find a new place in harmony. That, somehow, we'd find meaning in our loss, and that would make our experiences together seem all the richer. I'd write to you, day after day. You must remember what I said. I don't. Not really. I know I asked about all the what-ifs and the whys. I asked what I missed, if I could have noticed anything, what I could have done differently, if somehow I or something was truly to blame. You said there wasn't. You said that it was something that happened, no more, no less. And yet you assured me that I, that we, would come to find meaning in it. Rarity has perhaps been the least worse for wear. She's curating her own clients now, her work known across Equestria. It's almost frightening the intensity with which she attacks her work these days. She avoids Ponyville now, insisting that Sweetie Belle visit her rather than returning to the boutique. None of us speak with her much anymore. But she's found her own place, and for that, I can only be happy for her. Pinkie Pie and Fluttershy are both still devastated. They put it aside most of the time, but they have told me of the times they curl up together and silently sob for their most colorful of friends. Few other ponies would realize. I wouldn't have if they hadn't said. I don't think Fluttershy and Macintosh have spoken more than twice since Rainbow's funeral. I know he misses her. Please, tell me, is this the kind of meaning we were supposed to gain? Applejack is perhaps the worst, though. She doesn't even pretend she doesn't still hurt. It's painful, you know, when I think of her. How often did she run into Rainbow, or Rainbow into her, while she was working in her orchard? Yet she goes out into those orchards every day, does her work, and goes to sleep after you lower the sun. Applejack doesn't smile anymore. That's what really hurts. She had this wonderful, open, honest smile. She loved her life, and she loved her work. She loved her orchard, her friends, and her family. And every smile showed that. Maybe her smile hasn't changed, and it's still as honest as it ever was. She just doesn't want to love anything anymore. The meaning she found must have been that you can't trust anything anymore. Part of me died when I found out that was how she feels. Maybe I feel the same way too. I don't know. Do you? Yes, Rainbow Dash is dead. With her, I think our friendship died too. And we found nothing to fill this gaping crevasse in our hearts. I hope you're right. And what we are supposed to learn to gain meaning from this pain, this void, this hole, this death, is still to come. On this horrible anniversary, I speak again, failing hope that there is something yet to learn. But we've not learned it yet. Your faithful student... Princess Twilight Sparkle. Twilight reread her letter twice, her face an inexpressive mask. Her first personal letter to Princess Celestia since one year before. Then, 
with no fanfare, preamble, or any indication whatsoever of emotion, she set it ablaze with the spark of her aubergine magic. Twilight watched the ashes for a moment, her gaze following their curling, uncertain tumble to the stone floor, before turning and leaving her private study. She was nearly late for her meeting with the High Airy of Griffonistan. It was good that she took the time for this. There were duties to perform, important responsibilities she had to bear. Feelings only got in the way. Regal Indiscretion by North Star And the next thing I knew, the shelves were completely cleared. Thankfully the window was open at the time, or Rainbow Dash would have been picking up broken glass as well as books. The two ponies shared a laugh at yet another amusing incident at the Ponyville Library. The early morning sun streamed through the stained glass windows of the corridor, casting a rainbow-colored glow on both mares. Breakfast was a recent memory, and Princess Celestia and Twilight Sparkle were sharing a light walk through the castle to work it off. Was she injured at all? the princess asked. Not even a scratch. I'll never know how she doesn't get hurt while doing all these stunts more often. She certainly is gifted, that filly. Not gifted enough to spend her entire morning nap time reshelving. It wouldn't have been fair to Spike to make him clean up after her. A moment's silence passed as they walked, reaching the end of the corridor. Student and teacher passed through a doorway to a vast courtyard in the heart of the castle. Nearby was a tall, slender tower, the home of the co-regents of Equestria. Twilight had only been in this tower a few times in her years in Cantalot, always afraid of intruding on her mentor's private life. It was with some trepidation that she followed Celestia into that very same tower now. And how are things with your special friend? Twilight smiled despite herself. Amazing! We do so much together. Talking, studying, going for walks in the woods. I'm still spending some time with my other friends, of course, but I'm having so much fun. During last week's meteor shower, we had a picnic in this small clearing in the middle of Whitetail Wood to watch. Just the two of us. It was wonderful. And I've been promised a private dinner when I go home tomorrow evening. She blushed as she realized how much she was babbling. Celestia only smiled. I'm very happy for you, Twilight. You have learned so much about friendship in the past few years. Now you have an opportunity to apply what you've learned in an even greater way. It does feel like more than just friendship. We're very good friends, but it feels different. We've done things together that I would never have dreamed of doing with the others. Please go on. Well, it's funny you should ask. Oh, never mind. No, go on. Twilight's blush deepened. She had to ask, no matter how embarrassing it was. She only hoped the princess would not think any less of her. The thing is, I could use some advice. It's really embarrassing, but I can't really ask any pony else. Maybe Cadence or Rarity, but I'd rather not. I'm listening. Well, you see, we went back to the library after the meteor shower was over. It was late, and... I suggested spending the night. She looked down at her hooves, dreading the thought of making eye contact. It didn't make sense to put the guest bed together when my bed was big enough for both of us. <clears throat> um, you can probably figure out the rest. I see, Celestia replied. The thing is, you see, uh, um, Twilight began, sounding more like Fluttershy than herself. When we were, um, you know... Yes? The princess suppressed the urge to finish the story on her student's behalf. She had a good idea of what Twilight was about to say, but did not want to interrupt. The filly had to say the words herself. It was the only way she would learn. Well, we were together, and my horn, um, uh, went off. The last words were spoken with barely a whisper. Celestia was silent for a moment, as if delicately considering her response. 
That must have been embarrassing for you. She finally replied sympathetically. Not half as embarrassing as explaining to Spike why his basket was full of flowers the next morning. Twilight let out a nervous laugh. I can imagine. I couldn't figure out how to turn the flowers back into his pillow and blankie either. I don't know what it is about me and accidental spells turning things into plants. At least Rarity liked them. It was at this point that Twilight noticed that they were right outside the door to Princess Celestia's private quarters. The princess opened the door and led Twilight into the reception area outside her bedroom. Wait here, Celestia instructed. Make yourself comfortable. Her bedroom door opened and she passed through it. Make yourself comfortable? Easy for you to see, Twilight thought. She followed her mentor's instructions as closely as she could, settling into a lounge chair. A moment later, the princess emerged with a small, age-blackened iron ring. She passed it from her magical field into Twilight's. The violet unicorn examined it carefully. Put this on your horn first. It reduces the potency of your magic, but does not restrict it completely. Deliberate spells may be cast with some extra effort, but it will prevent accidental spells from being cast. Wow! Um, thank you, princess. But... No buts! It's just... I'm kind of surprised you have this. Celestia closed her eyes, a neutral expression on her face. The alicorn stepped over to a chaise across from Twilight, settling herself on it. You must understand something, Twilight. My elevated position in equestrian society aside, I am still made of flesh and bone like any pony else, with the same capacity for feelings and emotions. I feel joy, sorrow, anger, and yes, desire. I have had my fair share of lovers. A guilty grin passed onto her face as their memories came flooding back. Some would say more than my fair share. I never realized. Twilight blushed. What did you think really created the Everfree Forest? Student and teacher alike shared a laugh at this unexpected confession. I, I can't believe you said that, Twilight said between gasps of breath. It is hardly something I am going to include in history books. Goodness, if historians were aware of all my indiscretions, we would need at least another Star Swirl the Bearded's wing worth of books to record them. Princess! Twilight squealed, breathless from laughter once more. Twilight was sure her face was redder than the apples adorning her friend's flank. To her surprise, however, she did not feel as much discomfort as she had when the conversation started. The invisible barrier between teacher and student that had been felt since Phillyhood did not feel impenetrable anymore and the unicorn did not quite know how to approach the situation. Matters of romance, she finally selected as a definition, were not the usual topic of discussion with one's teacher. But if she was no longer a student, what was she? Celestia smiled at her young charge. She rose from her seat and approached her, leaning down to draw her into a hug. There is no shame in growing up, Twilight. Remember that. I, I will. You have much to be proud of. Since we first met at your entrance examination, you have grown and matured into a fine young mare. I am very proud of you. Wow! Thank you! Twilight replied ecstatically. And if you ever need more advice, or have any questions, do not hesitate for a moment to ask. After a life as long as mine, there is very little that will come as a surprise. Celestia loosened the hug to look at her student. As I said, you have grown up. Regrettably, you will not be my faithful student much longer. I hope that, once that momentous day comes, we will remain in contact with each other. Not as student and teacher, but as friends. Friends. The idea of being friends with a pony she admired more than any other had always seemed like such an impossibility. Something she would only achieve when she had nothing left to learn, and could consider herself an equal with the princess, as if she ever could. I would like that, princess. And I hope that when you visit next, you will not come alone. It's a deal, friend. Wonderbolt by Woven Word What is a Wonderbolt? 
Sometimes I ask myself that when I'm feeling particularly depressed. It's not hard getting into that mood these days, so the question buzzes around constantly. I've come up with several answers for it, but most of them aren't very satisfying. What is a Wonderbolt? A Wonderbolt is a soldier. No, that's not right at all. A Wonderbolt is an aerial acrobat. Pretty cut and dry. A Wonderbolt is a hero. I wish that were true. A Wonderbolt is a sister, a role model, a friend, a pony. Just a pony in the end. Is that really okay? To say just a pony? A pony can be a lot of things after all. But a Wonderbolt does have a little something extra added to that description. Everything I mentioned. Except the soldier part. Never did care much for that one. I look away from the torn up poster that started me down this familiar line of thought. The words are barely legible, but they still sting a little bit. Final show. I didn't go to that one. Spitz was so pissed. That was months ago, though. I wonder what's become of her. Now that I think about it, I've really been pretty disconnected from the rest of the world since I came back here. It's like my life now consists solely of time spent at the market or in this library. I'm not complaining. Why should I? I get to live with her, spend time with her, speak to her. Sometimes I even get to speak with her. Besides, the list of places I frequent is still longer than hers. I also need to take care of her, make sure she eats. I'm her friend, after all. It's what any friend would do, right? I take a peek at her, out of the corner of my eye. She still hasn't moved. Her head is resting on the rails, looking over the first floor. I absentmindedly run a hoof over the window's dark wooden frame. Dead wood. It's been quite some time since this building felt alive. Figurative and literally. Looking outside, across the river's murky waters, it's easy to see why. Twilight doesn't look outside anymore. I don't blame her. It really makes me wonder about the ponies that started all this. How could anyone be so stupid? Our world used to be beautiful and green, even if I took it for granted back then. I think most of us did. Well, okay, Fluttersh, I didn't. She used to love all those little critters that roamed around. Even when things started changing, she'd still open her home to them, feed them, heal them. I can't remember how long it was before she realized she couldn't heal them all anymore. That the food wasn't enough. It was a horrible mess, with the land growing sterile and the trees dying. All sorts of animals losing their homes and feeding grounds. And of course, they turned to her. She said she could handle it, that the rest of us had bigger things to worry about. So she went to the market more frequently and kept buying more and more food. But storehouses have a limit, and since the lands weren't producing as much as they used to, the market eventually had to prioritize ponies. She didn't let that stop her, though. She started collecting as much food as she could from the wilderness. From the Everfree. We used to be so scared of that place. I think I can see its lifeless husk from here. Well, that solution didn't last her long, of course. But she kept trying. She tried so hard to help her little friends. She had such a gentle soul. On the other hoof, it has to take a very ignoble soul to do something like this to our world. <laughs> ignoble. When that happened? Probably around the time I started reading things besides Daring Do. Or maybe it was when Daring faced off with that prissy, stuck-up noble pony. Rarity had nothing on that guy. I remember back when Twy smiled every time I used fancier words. I remember back when Twy smiled. Heck, it takes a lot to make me crack a smirk these days. And I'm supposed to be the immature prankster. Must be the weather. Not many clouds out today, though. Well, what passes for clouds in a sky filled with smoke? It's still pretty obvious the sun is setting right now. 
setting itself. I never managed to understand it, no matter how many times Twilight explained it to me between painful sobs and racked breaths. A body without a soul, moving across the sky because there's nothing else it can do. I wonder how long it can last like that, a shell of its former self without something to give it strength from within. Days are colder now, even though it's summer, and it's a bad idea to stay outside for too long. That never stopped AJ, though. She just kept bucking those trees day in and day out. Even when they had to take the S down from Acres, that mare never broke. She never let any of it get to her, just keeping it all inside and staying strong for the rest of us. Even after... Hmm. That's not a train of thought I want to board right now. Even my wings seem to agree, since they're getting all twitchy. I watch as a couple of feathers come loose and fall slowly to the floor. They say Pegasus' feathers are full of magic. Or at least they used to be. It's what allowed us to fly. To glide and soar and race through the clouds. Just like unicorns used to have most of their magic in their horns. Or the way earth ponies could make things grow through their special connection with the land. Just by letting their hooves touch the ground. Now I'm lucky if I manage to slowly hover above Ponyville's rooftops. Twilight has difficulty levitating more than one thing at a time. At some point, something started to disappear from our world. Magic would be one way to put it. Twy explained it better, but I can't really remember the term she used. Since Pegasus' feathers were full of magic to help us fly, they'd never touch the ground if they fell from our wings. They'd keep floating a tiny bit above whatever surface they had below, not quite ending their fall. I never noticed it back then, since you have to stay and watch for a while to tell. That just wasn't my style. By the time my feathers were halfway to the ground, I was already halfway to wherever I was headed. My bedroom floor is full of cyan feathers now, lying still on the ground. Final show indeed. The sun has almost finished setting. That's a trigger around here, which basically means it's time to start making dinner. I know what we're making tonight. Nothing fancy, so it shouldn't take us more than 10, maybe 20 minutes. After that, we'll eat in silence. Shower. Go to bed. Same old routine. Twilight's routines are the only things that keep her going, I think. It's the only reason she still moves around during the day, so I'm pretty sure that I won't be able to break her out of it when she gets started. I should probably just get it over with. See what I have to see. Leave if it doesn't stick. Not that I'd ever actually leave, but I'm sure Twy wouldn't want me to see me around as much. And she wouldn't, even though I'd still be around. Can't keep stalling, though. The clock's ticking must be close to driving one of us insane by now. That dumb clock. I can't believe it survived this long. Every awkward moment, every announcement of bad news, every tragic day, every silence that stretched too long. It's always been there, and I've always hated it. Right, the talk. How do I start? I don't want to sound too forward, but I don't have that much time either. Maybe a throwback to happier days? No, that's just depressing. Just come out and say it? She might ignore me. She does that sometimes, when she hears something she doesn't want to deal with. Heck, I do that sometimes. Oh, come on! This wasn't so hard. Once upon a time... I could actually talk with my friends about anything. I needed some coaxing, sure, but I got there eventually. And this is Twilight, the only one I can't have a conversation with anymore. It's not often, but we still do it. Bucket. Do you miss the oldies? Wow, my voice really cracked there for a bit. Has it really been that long since I've spoken? I wait for a couple of seconds. I'm suddenly all too aware of the fact that I'm sweating. I don't know if she's in the mood to talk, but I really, really hope she is. She doesn't move, still resting her head on the rail, but I manage to hear her soft voice. Of course I do, but there's nothing to gain from chasing after days long past. She sounds so bored, so lifeless. Silence stretches between us for a long time. Now that I know she'll answer, I have to take the plunge. I can do this. You know, I start, understanding that there's no turning back now. 
Sometimes I wonder if there's still something worth living for in this world. It's a grim thought, one that's also been circling around my head lately. Still, it does manage to tie into what I want to tell her. I see her neck tense up. Twilight turns her head very slowly to gaze upon me with dead eyes. Well, maybe not dead. I think I see pity there. She's giving me a once-over. I used to be proud of my body. It was vibrant, athletic, lithe, and all those other things I had considered to be so important. Now, not so much. I try not to shift. I try to keep my eyes on hers, but it's actually painful to see her like this. I hope my face is still some semblance of neutrality, because I am terrified right now. I can feel her scrutinizing every detail she can glimpse from my appearance. Every wrinkle and scar. The way I'm standing, leaning against the window's frame, not quite facing her. The fact that I've been holding my breath since I stopped talking. It's too much. I snap my eyes forward and catch a sight of a discarded tiara among the shelves. Bad memories. Not really what I need right now. The greed-out gem doesn't mean anything anymore. Just another reminder of what used to be. I can't even remember where I left my necklace. Before I can start down another avenue toward depression, I feel her gaze break away. She turns before looking back into nothingness again. There isn't. I know she's given it thought. There's not much left to do except think nowadays. And I believe that's always been Twilight's favorite hobby next to reading. Unfortunately, thinking has become a very self-destructive activity. I have to actively fend off bad thoughts, so I can't even imagine what it must be like for her. She's probably marred with them. If there's something I'm most thankful for, it's that she hasn't given up. Yet. Okay then, here goes. I know. That's the worst part. It really is. But I keep asking myself the same question, over and over. Hoping the answer will change someday. There, I said it. I think. Well, not really, but the opening's there. Please take it. Be my new answer. Nothing. No reaction. Too subtle, I guess. Twilight was never rarity, so this might not be the best way to go about it. The last sliver of light is about to disappear on the horizon. Only a couple of minutes left, so this will be my last chance. I don't know if I'll be able to work up the courage to try again tomorrow, or the day after that. Straightforward it is. Let me put it another way, Twilight. I'm almost whispering. That wasn't my intention, but at least the sound carries in this place. You're the only pony that I still care about. The only one that I still want to see happy, just for the sake of it. But you're so... I trail off for a moment, looking for the right word. Dead? Defeated? So buried in depression and sadness that I could disappear tomorrow and you wouldn't care. Wait, that's not. In an instant, she's in front of me. I didn't see a flash of teleportation, but certain details escape me nowadays. There's a very frightening mixture of emotions in her eyes. Anger and sadness. I've seen it too many times, but never from her. I'd be jumping with joy at the fact that she's expressing something, but my body's too busy being frozen in fear. That doesn't last long. I'm too focused on studying her eyes to notice the hoof that strikes me in the side of my face. I don't break eye contact. I'm too frightened to let her out of my sight and too shocked to do anything else. I notice that one of the emotions is winning over the other, and I pray to the stars that it's not the anger. I can feel something warm trickle down my muzzle. I think I should be feeling pain, but maybe it'll register later. Twilight's weakened. We all are, but she isn't weak. Her magic can still do pretty nasty things if she puts her mind to it. Not that she'd ever do that. Not my... Uh, our Twilight. And then, just as suddenly as she struck me, she pulls my muzzle toward hers in a very violent motion. Our lips basically smash together before I realized... She's not trying to break my teeth. She's kissing me. She's kissing me. I regain enough control over my body to start returning the gesture, however clumsily. 
I can feel her tears running down my cheeks. They can't be mine, I don't cry. And her soft sniffs that had nothing to do with needing more air. Eventually, the euphoria passes. The kiss slows and we break away from each other. She looks at me with pleading eyes, pleading for me to understand that she would never be so cold, that she would care. I know that now. She doesn't have to say it. And she doesn't. Words. There should be words filling this empty silence, but neither of us can conjure them up with the eloquence that would be necessary to not ruin the moment. So, I let the moment pass by. And then another. And another. And I notice she's doing the same thing. Eventually, though, she decides to ask something. Are you sure you want to do this? Somehow, in her tone of voice, in the way she says it, I understand that she's not asking about my feelings. She's not wondering if I love her, if I'm just desperate enough to be with anyone, or if I'm just mistaking one emotion for another. I can tell, so she doesn't need to spell it out for me. She's asking if I want to give us a shot in a world like this. What's the right answer? I could say that she's the only one that keeps me going. That I don't want to stay on the sidelines and hope that nothing happens. Hope that everything stays the same, just so she'll still be there. I could say that I want to protect her from this world. That I want to be there whenever she needs me. It's what the Wonderbolts stood for. Protectors, more than aerial acrobats. Ponies that could be there because they were fast enough to arrive when they were needed. And that's what I want to be for her. Maybe not to protect her. Maybe that's an excuse, just so I can justify staying near her. Wait, why do we need to justify that? It's not like she actually needs protection, given everything she can do on her own. Aren't my feelings enough? They are. Or at least they should be. A Wonderbolt is a pony that takes care of others, even in the worst situations. Is that really what I'm doing, though? Am I protecting a fragile heart, or am I taking advantage of it? Am I latching onto a sure thing just because I know Twilight is probably as star for love as I am? I noticed that I've been thinking for far too long now, and she's still waiting for an answer. Then again, long minutes of silence in the middle of our conversations aren't exactly uncommon. I suppose we should work on that, since it's no way to start a relationship. But the answer is simple. I shouldn't doubt myself right now. I need to look sure. I need to look confident. That's right. I never really needed to think about it. Yes. I move forward to embrace her. And she lets me. She slowly hugs me back with a single foreleg. I wrap my wings around her, letting her rest her muzzle against my neck. This is how it feels. This is how it should feel. Warm and soft. Sweet and safe. This is what love feels like, I'm sure of it. It's that slight tingle spreading throughout my body. The very thing that left this world, robbing us of our lives. Yeah, I'll be making rain booms again in no time, and Twilight will start up her research once more. We'll bring a little color back to this barren world. This is love, right? My right wing shifts a bit and a feather starts to fall. It twirls and sways in the air under the final glowing light of the sunset, falling painstakingly slow and getting closer to the floor with every second. Closer, twirl, and closer, sway, and closer. I avert my eyes. I don't need to see it. I gave a glance over her shoulder towards the goggles hanging on the rail. That was my dream once, during happier times, simpler times. Dreams are meant to be shattered, Rainbow. That's what Rarity taught me once. If only so we can pick up the pieces, become stronger, and try again. I never did get to try for the first time, but now I have my chance. She'll be everything to me. The one I want to protect, even when she doesn't need it. The one I share everything with, even if she still holds things back. The one I love with all my heart even if I'll never know if she feels the same way. The one that makes me want to keep living, in spite of everything else. And I... 
I'll be her Wonderbolt. Chrysalis Kidnaps Rainbow Dash for 10 Minutes by Cloudhop Three weeks before the wedding of Princess Twilight Sparkle and Rainbow Dash, an unearthly silence fell over the dining hall, which was empty, save for two princesses and a terrified male mare, who was currently flying away from the scene as fast as possible. Princess Celestia calmly sipped her tea, watching her former student peruse what seemed like a very aggravating letter. Twilight was still terrible at hiding her emotions, and it was clear right now that she was about to explode with the fury of a thousand suns, possibly literally. It was, for this reason, Celestia had cast a triple-layered total barrier and thermal insulation spell over the tea kettle. What? yelled Twilight, having reread the letter twice, just to make sure she hadn't ingested a fatal dose of poison joke. She opened her mouth again, but no sound came out. Instead, she just gestured wildly at the piece of paper levitating in front of her. I didn't that <laughs> Twilight let out an annoyed huff and slammed the letter onto the table. <coughs> Celestia noted with pride that the table did not, in fact, spontaneously burst into flames and mentally commended Twilight on her self-control. So? Celestia innocently sipped her tea. Who's it from? What has this mysterious pony endeavoured to write to you about? Twilight glowered at her former mentor for several seconds before replying in a voice that only quavered slightly. It was from Chrysalis, and it was her informing me that she had kidnapped my fiancé Rainbow Dash and is holding her for ransom. Oh dear. Celestia calmly placed her teacup on the table. That doesn't sound good at all. Celestia then proceeded to weave yet another incredibly complex dual-layered total barrier spell around the teacup just in case. So what's the ransom demand? Twilight huffed. She wants me to turn her into a princess! At this, Celestia could no longer contain her mirth and let out a very unprincess like snook <laughs> before stuffing a hoof in her mouth and quietly giggling. <laughs> Twilight didn't seem to think it was funny. This isn't funny! She said, further reinforcing the idea that she clearly did not approve of the copious amounts of funny going on at the table. Celestia tried in vain to restrain her fits of laughter. <laughs> oh, oh my. <clears throat> I'm terribly sorry, Twilight, but Chrysalis has always been prone to these kinds of... episodes. <laughs> Twilight wasn't listening. I can't believe this! The nerve of that wretched changeling queen to kidnap my rainbow dash! Doesn't she know who I am? Doesn't she realize who she's dealing with? Did that stupid Neil not learn her lesson the first time? Don't screw with romance! Celestia nodded. An astute observation, Twilight. Love is, indeed, a powerful force of... Whatever wisdom Celestia had been attempting to impart on Twilight was lost in the subsequent massive explosion that obliterated half the dining room and sent flaming bits of tea table flying off at supersonic speeds. Twilight had launched herself into the air in a truly reckless manner and had accelerated so fast she triggered her own sonic twi-boom a mere ten meters off the ground. A slightly singed Celestia sat in the center of the destruction, still holding onto her teacup and tea kettle, the only two items in a hundred foot radius that had survived unscathed. The solar diarch poured herself another cup of tea and looked up through the new hole in her ceiling. Celestia considered going after Twilight and trying to explain that a class 5 magical detonation was not going to solve her problems, but considering that it was Chrysalis on the receiving end, she decided that it would be much more entertaining for her to simply sit back and enjoy the show. At least, until she realized that Twilight could very well accidentally wreck the entire changeling civilization. Unfortunately, Twilight was already long gone, and given her new Alicorn magic, was now likely unstoppable. Oh well, at least I saved the tea, thought Celestia, as she took another sip from her teacup. Whoa! <laughs> 
<laughs> Far away, in a secret changeling hive buried beneath the earth, an unearthly cackle echoed from the black throne. <laughs> Disguised by a forest under ten different ancient illusion enchantments and a magical cloaking crystal, the Changeling Hive was truly a masterpiece of deception, and one that had escaped detection for over a thousand years. Unfortunately, it had also been discovered two weeks after the Cantalot wedding, because you can't hide where your home is after failing to invade the capital of Equestria, especially when Equestria has Twilight Sparkle on its side. <laughs> Rainbow Dash winced at yet another stream of cackling laughter forcing its way out of Chrysalis's repulsive vocal cords. Is there a reason you're possessed by uncontrollable laughter? She deadpanned. Chrysalis snirked. Of course, my little captive. I am simply delighted that my plan has gone so flawlessly. Soon, Twilight Sparkle will seek you out and I can exact my revenge. Soon, she will bow to my demands. A groan emanated from inside a small cage that glowed with an unnatural green hue. A blue pegasus sat inside it, shackled to various locks with chains that were, themselves, chained to locks, which were locked with more locks, and then enchanted with an anti-lock-picking spell, and made invisible, just for the heck of it. You idiot! Twilight is a princess! She'll destroy you when she finds out what you've done! Chrysalis cackled. Ah, but dear Rainbow Dash, that's all a part of the plan. Rainbow Dash tilted her head in confusion. Twilight destroying you is part of your plan. I... Uh, 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 wait a minute. Chrysalis frowned. No, I mean... Uh, never mind. My point is... I plan on her attempt to usurp the throne. One of Rainbow Dash's hooves stamped on the steel floor of her prison. She isn't going to usurp anything, you crazy old hag! She's gonna banish you! Nonsense, said Chrysalis. Every pony tries to usurp the throne. Chrysalis stretched out on her royal throne made of black, solidified changeling spit. Mm, just look at me. Who wouldn't want this? A gagging noise worked its way out of Rainbow Dash's throat, but Chrysalis didn't seem to notice. She will try to usurp the throne, and I will offer her an irresistible offer. My throne, if she turns me into a princess. Whatever sense Rainbow Dash had managed to scry from Chrysalis's mad rantings was instantly obliterated. What? A disturbingly dreamy look overtook the ancient changeling queen. I shall be the prettiest princess to walk Echoes. Millions will melt before my adorableness, and I shall happily stride through the land, spreading friendship and love and- but You're a queen! Protested Rainbow Dash. You already have wings and a horn! What can make you a princess possibly change? To her credit, Chrysalis looked genuinely confused. You mean- Becoming a princess doesn't automatically make you cute and adorable. Before Rainbow Dash could perform the world's most epic face hoof, the world turned white. Yeah! Twilight Sparkle was mad. Perhaps mad wasn't the best word for it. She was incensed. She was livid. She was furious. She was enraged. She was positively boiling with anger. She had been wronged, and she would exact her vengeance upon her transgressor. She was so mad, she hadn't yet noticed that she was setting the air on fire behind her. As she pummeled mercilessly through several hapless clouds, she also set them on fire. The nearby Pegasi were very confused. Lightning crackled across her horn as she readied an absurdly powerful seeking spell. Given how dumb Chrysalis had been so far, she was pretty sure she knew where Rainbow Dash was, but she just wanted to be sure, because Princess Twilight Sparkle always did her homework. 
With a loud bang, a formless sphere erupted from the blazing purple dot in the sky and rocketed across the entire continent of Equestria. In a matter of seconds, the spell had pinpointed Rainbow Dash precisely where Twilight thought she would be, inside the Changeling Hive. I've got you now, you ill-begotten queen, she seethed, a streak of purple stars trailing behind her. Twilight arrived at her destination, and the sky was filled with ominous clouds swirling above her. Excessive amounts of lightning danced across her lithe body as she focused her magic and bent the fabric of the universe to her will. Her eyes glowed with eldritch power, and a massive runic sigil began tracing itself behind her. The heavens split open, and twilight was bathed in sunlight as reality itself began to warp and bend around her. The Princess of Magic herself plummeted towards the Earth, angry purple energy trailing behind her, spontaneously opening microscopic portals to other dimensions. A blindingly bright falling star struck the ground with such force, the explosion could be heard from Cloudsdale. The blast was so great that it shifted Equus's orbit around the sun by four inches. 3,000 years later, this error would throw off a pony's clock by two seconds, causing him to just miss his train, preventing him from meeting his soulmate and triggering his slow descent into madness. An unfortunate but necessary sacrifice. The angry alicorn sliced through layers of solid rock like it was low-fat margarine on a hot day, and the earth bled molten lava behind her. A beam of light roared through the changeling hive and finally tore a gaping wound in the ceiling of the Black Throne. She impacted the ground with a magical burst that flung every changeling in the room against the wall and left a charred crater ten yards wide in the once pristine floor of Chrysalis's royal court. Of course, most of the floor was black anyway, so no pony really could have noticed. The smoke hadn't even cleared before Rainbow Dash was freed from her chains and the chains on her locks and the locks on her chains on her locks and the locks on her locks and the invisibility spell on the locks and the cage and the anti-rescue spell on the cage. Twilight also defused the bomb rigged to the door, the arrow shafts embedded in the wall, the trap door leading to a massive dragon cave below them and also defeated the massive dragon in said cave just for good measure. She then cured Rainbow Dash of her cold, her sore hooves, and discovered a cure for cancer before teleporting her away to safety. Twilight, growing white hot with magical energy, stood before Chrysalis and her black throne. What do you have to say for yourself, monster? A grimace worked its way across Chrysalis's face. I was hoping that would have taken longer. With a pop, Rainbow Dash found herself falling face first into a very, very soft bed. She mumbled, fishing her head out from the blanket. Except, it wasn't just a blanket. It was a blanket that was covered in roses. Looking around, Rainbow Dash quickly realized the entire room had been covered in soft, velvety rose petals and was lit entirely by candlelight. Soft music was playing somewhere behind the door, and the whole place had been perfectly organized and decorated for what seemed like a very expensive date. Twilight had probably teleported her into a fancy hotel room. Probably. Rainbow Dash wasn't sure why her fiancé had teleported her into a hotel room instead of, say, her bedroom, but hey, whatever. Then again, something seemed familiar. Is this Twilight's bedroom? She glanced down beneath her, using her hoof to sweep away some of the rose petals, and saw a familiar purple blanket with a star in the middle. Kinky! Princess Twilight Sparkle stood at the foot of Chrysalis's throne, glowering at the malevolent changeling queen. So, are you here to beg for forgiveness after I sweep aside all your defenses in a matter of seconds? Are you here to cower before the unfathomable power of Equestria? Are you simply going to run away with your tail between your legs like a treacherous fool you are? Chrysalis sneezed. Oh, sorry. I'm allergic to Mary Sue's. Mary what's it? Twilight asked, frowning. I... just... Chrysalis dragged a hoof down her face and groaned. Never mind. I am not here to run away. 
I am here to make you an offer. Twilight raised an eyebrow. Well... Chrysalis leaned back in her throne and sighed. I was going to, anyway, but you just teleported my offer away. I was going to free Rainbow Dash in exchange for you turning me into a princess. Yeah, I kind of figured that out after the not-so-subtle letter you sent me. Twilight angrily pawed at the ground with one of her gold-adorned hooves. But what am I supposed to do now? Asked Chrysalis, throwing her hooves up in the air. I have nothing to blackmail you with! I'll never become a princess! Twilight's jaw dropped, and one of her eyelids twitched. What? Why would any pony be made a princess through blackmail? You become a princess after demonstrating leadership and being capable of handling power with responsibility! Chrysalis frowned. You mean you didn't force Princess Celestia to turn you into a princess by concocting a contrived gambit that forced her to choose between losing something dear to her and turning you into a princess? I... No! Why would I do that? I earned my princesshood! Oh, bother. Don't tell me this is a Canterlot wedding all over again. Raising an eyebrow, Twilight sat down on her rump as her curiosity momentarily overcame her bloodlust. What do you mean all over again? Chrysalis mumbled something incomprehensible. Well, you see, I thought the best way to make friends was to invade a high-profile wedding and threaten the populace with death and destruction. It wasn't until your brother and that annoying pink one knocked me out of Canterlot with an incredibly painful love explosion that I learned that crashing a wedding is not, in fact, proper diplomacy. An ill-defined, high-pitched whine worked its way out of Twilight's throat. What? So, I guess I wasn't supposed to kidnap Rainbow Dash and blackmail you into turning me into a princess, but I have another offer. Chrysalis motioned towards the throne she sat on with a hoof. If you turn me into a princess, I will give you my throne. Twilight blanched. What? Oh, but where are my manners? I haven't even introduced myself properly. Quincy, get over here! A small changeling stumbled forwards with what seemed to be the changeling equivalent of terror written across his face. He had barely found his footing when the queen started ranting. Quincy! You deplorable failure of a changeling! How could you fail me so completely? What do you have to say for yourself? Unfortunately, Chrysalis apparently wasn't interested in what he actually had to say for himself. Enough! I don't want excuses! I want results! Chrysalis emphasized the last word by flinging Quincy against a nearby wall with a loud thud, and the poor changeling fell to the ground. Princess Twilight Sparkle stood with her mouth agape. What in Equestria was that all about? Isn't it customary to greet a foreign dignitary by angrily punishing one of your messengers in a rage for no apparent reason? Twilight blinked. Then, deep inside her rather impressive brain, it all clicked. Chrysalis wasn't evil. She was just completely insane. In fact, perhaps the changelings did not have a hive mind at all, and instead obeyed their psychotic queen's every absurd request out of fear of retaliation. Perhaps the changelings weren't actually evil minions, but instead just creatures that were subject to incredibly powerful despot who had completely lost her marbles. <laughs> Meanwhile, Chrysalis had apparently broken into a fit of giggling for no reason. Twilight looked up through the shaft she had bored through the earth, still seeping molten rock into the blue sky above. Suddenly, it came to her. She could fix this. She could fix everything. Chrysalis, began Twilight, and the Changeling Queen quickly stifled her snickering. As a royal princess of Equestria, I find you guilty of being a crazy nutcase who is a danger to every pony around her. For your crimes, I hereby banish you to the moon! What? shouted Chrysalis, before a beam of unearthly light began to surround her. No, wait, I can explain. This, this is all just a misunderstanding. Her pleas fell on deaf ears as Twilight lowered her head and her horn glowed with magical power. She didn't have the elements of harmony with her, so she was just going to have to improvise. You can't do this! You're not Celestia! You don't even have the elements of harmony! This cannot be! I am invincible! For Twilight, 
Improvising meant simply launching Chrysalis upwards in the general direction of the moon at three times the escape velocity of Equus, while surrounding her in a protective bubble so she wouldn't get torn apart. The resulting explosion decimated the Queen's throne and carved yet another giant hole through the earth and into the sky. As Chrysalis turned into nothing more than a black speck above the clouds, Twilight realized she had forgotten to account for variations in the gravitational field of Equus in her orbital mechanics, and the Chrysalis would likely miss the moon by several miles. Oh well, that wasn't important. Princess Twilight Sparkle, savior of the changelings, held her head high as she marched down what remained of Chrysalis's throne. Having vanquished the crazy changeling queen, the changelings would now be free to live their fully autonomous lives in peace and harmony with the rest of… Wait a minute, the changelings weren't moving. Actually, they seem to have fallen over. Actually, no, they seem to have fallen asleep. Apparently, they didn't actually have free will, and were, in fact, part of a hive mind, and banishing their only queen to the moon had just rendered each and every one of them unconscious. Twilight blinked. Oops! So, what did we learn today? In an odd reversal of behavior, Celestia paced back and forth in front of Twilight, who was sitting on the floor of the throne room looking very guilty. Always remember to account for variations in the gravitational force of Equus before launching something out into orbit? She proposed. No! Don't launch anything or any pony out of orbit in the first place! Twilight mumbled something about Chrysalis totally deserving it, but Celestia pretended not to hear. And furthermore, giant explosions are not how you solve your problems. It had been a good few thousand years since Celestia had taken up the throne. She had been required to speak that line to a disconcerting number of her students. Her students, being exceptionally smart unicorns, often came up with memorable objections to not using large explosions to solve problems, including, but isn't the sun basically a giant perpetual explosion? And, but explosions are more fun! This, sadly, did nothing to prepare her for Twilight's answer. That's not true! protested Twilight Sparkle. The inverse explosion law states that as the size of an explosion increases, the number of problems it is incapable of solving quickly approaches zero! Celestia blinked. In that infinitesimal moment, when a bee's wings flapped only once and water droplets hung motionless in midair, Twilight had somehow filled a blackboard with arcane mathematical scribbles that apparently proved her point. Twilight, I... In the 4th century A.N., tired lectures managed to prove that the 4th dimensional projection of high-velocity manifold across the basis of time could be used to construct hugh lori matrix, which is known to have an exponentially increasing characteristic polynomial. If you take the inverse of the matrix, the law clearly states that the larger an explosion, the more problems you can solve with it. By the time you reach infinity, the number of problems you can't solve with it is infinitely close to zero. Princess Celestia let out an exasperated groan. Enough. Enough, Twilight. But Twilight Sparkle! The royal Cantalot voice echoed through the halls and immediately silenced the fledgling princess. As punishment for your short-sightedness, you must find Chrysalis and deliver her to me as soon as possible. Twilight opened her mouth to object, but it was quickly replaced with a disturbingly mischievous smile. Twilight? warned Celestia. What are you thinking? Oh, nothing. Twilight turned around and walked out towards the balcony. It's just you never specified how fast she had to be moving when I delivered her.